Hello, I am Cody Allingham, and this is the Transformation of Value podcast. This show is brought to you by Swarbricks, the first law firm in New Zealand to accept Bitcoin for legal services. The team at Swarbricks understand Bitcoin thinking and are knowledgeable about the legal aspects of Bitcoin in New Zealand in areas including estate planning, property and trusts. Swarbricks offers a 20% discount for services paid in Bitcoin. Find out more at swarbricks.co.nz slash Bitcoin. Now, in today's episode, I talk with James Vigiano. We talk about James's project Orange, which hosts a server in the popular multiplayer survival game Rust, where you can trade and learn about Bitcoin, have virtual meetups and complete missions to earn sats. We also cover James's experience trying to run a Bitcoin exchange in New Zealand and being denied banking services, as well as broader ideas about the future of the New Zealand economy and a realistic take on what CBDCs might actually look like. I do hope you enjoy this episode. If you want to get in touch with me, please send an email to hello at the transformation of value.com and I will get back to you. Otherwise, on to the show. Hey, there we go. Welcome. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you. How you been? Good, good. How was Japan? Yeah, it was good, man. I was over there for a month. Uh, yeah, I can't remember. Have you been to Japan before? I have, yeah, but only for a short trip. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, um, it was amazing. Thank you. I, um... I really needed it after three years. <laughs> yeah, after the lockdowns, right? You have to go out and see the world again. It was exactly what it needed to be, though. Like, even just from taking the airplane back, like, I just, I don't know, it was almost karmic. But, you know, I was just so thankful and um, grateful to just be able to go. And I mm. think, like, even the cabin crew and that, they kind of they kind of felt it. And I got, like, a, a free upgrade. And it was, oh, just, nice. it was just really really fun and um i don't know they must have changed the airplanes but i was able to use the internet i i remember oh, back, sick. back in the day that you never used to be able to use wi-fi and i was <laughs> like man that that's um so so powerful um and i talked to my friends i'm like man that's been normal in most airlines for like five ten years yeah it's a game changer right especially for a long haul flight you can still check your internet check your messages and stuff i i actually um used my bolt card uh from 30,000 feet, which I thought was <laughs> nice. kind of cool. It's like the Mile High Club. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. Um, you, and you, you've been traveling a bit recently as well? Not that much this year. I did a bit last year. Yeah, I still traveled a little bit during COVID, and it was always good to um, like have that feeling of not being trapped in New Zealand. Like yeah. Once you kind of get out of the plane, you remember the world is still running. You know, Things aren't quiet everywhere. Um, but yeah, doing some travel later this year to the US for a conference and then um, next year hoping to go to El Salvador again. What what conference are you looking to go to? Uh, the Atlanta Bitcoin Conference. Okay. That's um so that's Georgia, right? So that would be quite that sort of part of the US is quite quite a Bitcoin hub at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, so um it's pretty cool that within New Zealand you can fly direct into Houston and it seems that that like uh, Texas, Georgia and actually Another place we're planning on visiting is Bitcoin Park in Memphis. Yeah. So that I think that's where it is. That's um, Marty Bent and, and those guys are out, out that way, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. So it'd be cool to see what the community's like there. Yeah, I've, I've been following Bitcoin Park for a while. Um, I think it's a really cool concept of a, like a kind of like a maker space. Um, you know, they've got podcasting equipment, um, you know, spaces to do you know events and functions um and i think also maybe some builders are based out of there just uh, people working on projects yeah and i think they just that having that permanent spot where people can re regularly meet up is quite useful for that community so it's like touching base with the same people every month or so at a meetup is really helpful yeah I, I think that's been the big realization for me over the last year is seeing how important those in-person meetups are uh regular contact with people who are passionate to be working and in, in bitcoin and and on bitcoin adjacent projects and and that kind of proximity effect of having just people mulling over ideas and and kind of being industrious is uh, something quite powerful about that yeah it's really useful yeah it's um almost a, a vibe change to the the kind of lockdown era where i think a lot of people were sort of quite atomized and not able to really connect and so we've kind of had this pendulum swinging back the other way and i know for myself here in wellington uh i'm, I'm regularly meeting we have sort of a weekly uh honey badger meetup um and 
you know, I've got some of the other other events going on. But what's wh- where are you at the moment? You're you're up in Auckland, James. Yeah, I'm in Auckland at the moment. Um, yeah, and uh, it was actually that's what's been really cool about Bit Kiwi in New Zealand. Like catching up with you in person and the other guys has been it's been great. Yeah, what, what's the scene like up in Auckland though? I mean, as our as our biggest city, I mean, would you say there's there's a bit of stuff happening up there? Or yeah, I think it's um, being quite a large city. It's it's all spread out. There's different people doing different things. Um, I'm not a very in person social type, so <laughs> for me, it's going to like those special occasion meetups is what I like to do. But um, there is actually a really cool uh, little space in the heart of downtown Auckland. Um, the Ultra School of Bitcoin. I walked along, saw that, and I was like, such a shock. I was like, oh, wow, someone's doing something with Bitcoin, like branding everywhere, right in the heart of Auckland. Popped in, said hello. And it's just like a, um, I think it's just an idea they're trying to grow into something bigger. And so it's cool to see little things like that starting to happen. And there's a couple of restaurants that accept Bitcoin. So it's starting to starting to get traction. Yeah, I had uh, Hanoz on the show a couple of months ago and spoke about his journey to develop the Altruist School and, and that space. And it was... Uh, Really quite cool. I believe it is actually the first dedicated Bitcoin space in New Zealand that people yeah, can go to. So. I'll um, have to go back and listen to that episode. That'll be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was a couple of months ago now, but no, I'm really excited for what he's doing. But um, I'm keen to just hear from you, James, a little bit about what you're excited about, what's happening right now, either in your world or more broadly in, in Bitcoin space. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what I'm spending a lot of my time on at the moment is um, the Orange Project. So uh, we launched a fundraiser on Geyser. And the purpose of that was to get some funds to run, um, well, the funds are for a gaming community or a a gaming team or clan, a sports team type thing. And we host a server in a game called Rust, which is quite a popular survival game. Um, So what I've been doing every day is helping to really grow that virtual space. Because while it is a game, it is also a social space and it has a whole community around it with like Discord and like there is the meetups that are regularly happening there once a month, like more organized meetups that we try to film and broadcast and help get people's messages out. But there's also every day, it's like a town square. So you just bump into Bitcoiners every day that you chat with and meeting some people from all over the world, which is amazing. Yeah. So yeah, it's getting me quite excited. How did you how did you come and we, we will get back to your your origin story eventually I hope but how, how did you come to be working on that project like um uh, in this Rust game like how, how did how did Orange come about Um I think it it came about through just like wanting to keep on and making progress and improving with areas where I was getting traction So by traction for me was um having an impact with orange pilling people because that's really what I'm trying to do is orange pill people uh, if, I'm sure the listeners know what that means, but uh, it's basically helping people to understand and get comfortable with Bitcoin because that's something I really believe in. And I obviously have a vested interest because I have been using Bitcoin for a while and I love it. (laughs) Um, So during the uh, bull market years when, you know, things were bubbly and fun, I was jumping onto the games because I used to be a gamer when I was younger and I jumped into Rust and um, I just had this experience where, a lot of people on there are toxic. They're out there to kill each other. But the objective of the game isn't actually to kill each other. The objective is to survive. And I managed to get quite a bit of traction playing in the local scene, like around Australia and New Zealand community, through my play style, which was to trade with people rather than steal from them. I would offer them a trade. And through trading, uh, I was able to make a lot of progress in the game and build up a little bit of a following of players who wanted to play with me and learn my play style. And what I always did as part of uh, my strategy for survival was I'd set up a shop that I'd call the Orange Mart and I would put Bitcoin logos all over it. And I would just encourage people that, you know, we can exchange value with each other rather than stealing from each other. And then the progression of that is uh, Rust is quite an open game that allows people to host their own server um, and you can modify it in ways to your liking. And that's really what we're trying to do is by hosting our own server, focusing it around Bitcoin, having a Bitcoin community aspect to it is uh, it's really just an opportunity that I wanted to jump on. Um, I'm curious with Rust and, I mean, that's a proprietary game engine, right? So you're, you're within this sort of ecosystem. Is that right? Yeah, so it's like, um, so 
we're running our own version of the game, like the our own server that we're modifying in ways that we can modify however we like without their permission. But they, as the uh, primary developers of the game, so it's been around for 10 years, and every month they actually update it with new content that they're working on. Mm. So to continue to have our, our server visible through the main discovery platform which is steam which is like a social platform for gamers it's like the netflix of games um to continue to have our server discoverable there we have to keep up with their updates so in that sense they definitely control the game and are developing it but we are like private owners of our own island our own server yeah no man i am i'm I'm old enough to remember when steam came out unfortunately (laughs) but um i'm curious though we're talking about Bitcoin here, and I've got a copy of The Road to Serfdom here in my hand, talking about Australian economics and some of these concepts you're talking about. I really thought that was interesting. You said, you know, you don't need to shoot the other person, you can trade. And I think that's yeah. been a theme that uh, a couple of people talked about, things like RuneScape. Um, I was big into that when I was a kid. Oh, yeah. yeah <laughs> no. Um, and, you know, you know, Diablo, there's kind of different games where you can trade, uh, you know, objects in game. With the way you've done it, I mean, how, is that able to connect back into the Bitcoin ecosystem um, in terms of, say, using the Lightning Network? Is there is there ways to work that into what you, you've done with Orange? Oh, it's quite interesting. So there's a couple of ways to do it. What we've done so far, um, also everything we do is subject to change and we're trying to make progress every month. So that's the beauty of it is every month everything gets deleted and we rebuild and start again. But where we're at at the moment is players can upload an image onto a sign at their shop. Just like how in real life, if you go to El Salvador to a coffee shop, they put a QR code up on the wall um, and they just say, oh, just send your Bitcoin there and then we'll give you your coffee. Um, Same thing happens in game. So you can upload any QR code, bring whatever wallet you want to use for trading in the game. Um, So that's one method people are using to transact sets peer to peer is either through a QR code or just through passing um, notes to each other with an invoice on it or even just through having your lightning address written on the wall so people can see where to send the sets. But there is um, the way the server is trying to orange pill people is by rewarding them with Bitcoin too. Um, And so we have this, the current main kind of mechanism we're doing for that is by having a rare drop, like a loot reward in some of the harder missions across the island. And that rare drop, we've just used an item called blood because there's, you know, there's no other way to get blood in the game, so we can control the distribution of blood through these rare drops. And basically the theme is go out there, do the hard work, do the hard missions, collect the blood, and then come back to Orange. So part of the mission is to bring it back safely to Orange and not get killed along the way. Bring it back to Orange, trade it in, and we'll buy the blood off you with Bitcoin. So we have an automatic vending machine where you trade in the blood, and then you get a note that has the claim link to claim the sets. So you can use whatever wallet you want to claim the sets. Yeah, that's cool. A couple of things that come to mind here. Firstly, what you're doing is really this ability to run economic simulations through through games. I think there's something really interesting about that. And as I said, come back to the RuneScape example, and and maybe I mean maybe that was that was a little bit longer ago, but this this idea of objects being monetized, what objects end up becoming the money in game. Um, you know, you've got this blood um, that kind of acts as a, I guess, a, a substitute for uh, actual Bitcoin um, within the game, um, you know, world and the parameters of what's possible within the game in, in terms of existing objects. But you're able to peg it um, because it is, you know, you're in control of that. And so you're able to create this sort of one to one backing of, um, you know, Bitcoin and, and this this rare object. There's something really cool about that. And it's enables because because you're wiping the server out every month and starting again it enables this kind of rapid iteration of economics and sort of almost simulating um a, a micro economy i mean is that something that you planned originally or is that just sort of what has happened yeah um well the goal is to grow both an in-game economy and to help bitcoiners create a real economy so we've already had people join the server and advertise real world services like a graphic designer join the server and they put up a billboard that said, I'll design a custom animated graphic for you for a thousand sets or something like that. Another player did a little trade with them, got his little graphic. So there's real world trading happening too. On the point about the blood kind of peg thing, um, 
I tell people that no, uh, blood is blood is not Bitcoin. Uh, it's just something that for some reason the Orange Mart running the blood bank is happy to buy it off you for Bitcoin. But there's other items in the game that other players are happy to buy off you for Bitcoin too. So if you find like a, let's say I'm someone that to explain the game a bit, you, everyone starts off with nothing. And so to make progress, you have a lot of work to put in. But if you don't have much time, like you're working full time and you just want to play in the evening, you might join the server and be like, hey, I want to buy some resources. I want to buy some wood and some stones. I can build a house. I'll pay Bitcoin. Someone might sell you those for Bitcoin. So you don't necessarily have to... Uh, the only valuable thing... In, they're all digital items, so they're not really valuable, but they all could be worth Bitcoin to someone. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that there's there's nuance there, though. So they're, they're di digital items, but they do have value. I mean, just as Bitcoin does, it's just this abstraction that we have, which is, I think, a generational thing. It's it's something that maybe, you know, digital natives are, are able to grasp a little bit easier. But these objects do have value, and the value is defined through the market. Especially when they when they take a lot of time and work to earn. And if you're saving someone else that time and effort and they're willing to give you Bitcoin, it's just exchanging time for time. Yeah, and, and that's where I think uh, what I was sort of alluding to earlier, that there's this possibility to model these micro economies um, and experiment in ways that, you know, in the kind of meat space, we, we only get one go to, to do it. You know, it's, it's emergent. You can't go back and control Z and reset things, right? And despite um, jokes about the Great Reset and the lockdowns, uh, the reality is, you know, the economy, the real world economy is far too complex to be able to do that. But with a game um, in this digital space, you know, you can actually clear the cache and, and start again. And I'm wondering whether this relates back to your earlier career, um, which I'd be keen to just talk about that and sort of your, your introduction to Bitcoin. Because I know you, you were um, working in sort of finance and that sort of side of, of things uh, originally. And I imagine there's a lot of modeling, stochastic modeling, these kinds of things related to that and i'm just wondering whether there's connections with those two but i guess that and then your your introduction to bitcoin and your your origin story if that's okay please yeah we can we can go down that route so like for me the introduction was um i felt like a lot of people had the similar introduction that are, that are my age where i was at university at the right time everyone's at the right time but for me it was right when the silk road was the thing so um I personally wasn't using the Silk Road. I just, people in the dormitories where I lived, the university dorms, um, you know, oh, how'd you get that weed? Oh, bought it online. <laughs> oh, okay. And then they tell you, but you have to pay with Bitcoin. So the first interaction with it was, oh, okay. So that's like RuneScape Gold or Neopets. You know, it's just some digital token. It's nothing special. So I ignored it. The second interaction would have been in um, 2013. So yeah, I was studying at university, uh, a law degree and a commerce degree. And within commerce, I was really interested in finance and economics. Um, so I was running, I was a part of and then helped run an investment club at the university. And someone in the club was really excited because Bitcoin had gone all the way to 100 US dollars. So my my reaction then was, oh, okay, well, that's definitely a scam. <laughs> you know, that, that's some kind of internet bubble thing, like all the other internet scams that were around at the time. So I ignored it because... um. You know, through my gaming kind of history and internet history as a kid, you get exposed to lots of scams. You get ripped off all the time on the internet. And people uh, have always been selling fake money. There's always been like some kind of digital gold thing that's that's always just been a company offering some kind of token. Um, so I ignored it when I went to $100. But then later that year, <laughs> it went all the way up to $1,000. And I happened to be doing an internship. Um, it was the New Zealand summer, so it was around Christmas an internship with New Zealand's Sovereign Wealth Fund, the NZ Super Fund. Um, it was a really cool internship because the guy I was working under basically said, you can spend the summer just helping us research alternative asset classes. So to them, that meant looking at things like catastrophe bonds, which is like insurance on when a weather event happens. Um, but the most interesting alternative asset class was this new thing called Bitcoin that had just gone all the way to $1,000. So I spent the whole summer just like reading everything I could about Bitcoin, which back then was different little blogs on the internet, different posts, you know, uh, maybe a bit of Reddit was there. Um, lots of stuff. Because it was a bull market for Bitcoin, the media coverage of it was actually quite positive at the time. Um You'll notice that in the bull market years, like in 2013, 2017, and 2021, 
some of the media gets very bullish on it and hypes it up. Um, so it was quite exciting time. And then, you know, I, <laughs> like everyone, I bought high and then had that gut wrenching experience of, oh, it's fallen 90 or 85%. It's, you know, it's lost all its value. Everyone around me calling me an idiot, saying I've been scammed, saying that Bitcoin's dead. And you do feel like an idiot a little bit because you've just lost 85% of the money you've invested in something. So that was kind of my introduction to Bitcoin. And I think a lot of people have a similar introduction where they, they get in when it's really exciting and then they have to have to persevere with it through that bear market. So in those subsequent bear market years, I was still studying at university and doing other finance related internships and then went on and started a career at an investment bank on the trading floor. Did you see parallels between those two worlds, this interest in Bitcoin and this, you know, investment bank, you know, trading floor environment? Were you able to connect those two and integrate them together or were they quite separate for a while? Yeah, they are very connected, but the 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 response you'll get from talking to people in those industries back then, I don't know what it's like now, but they're very dismissive of it because when you talk about Bitcoin, the, the key traits that you're highlighting are quite disruptive and they are the incumbents and the the majority of their uh, competitive advantage comes from what's called regulatory capture. Mm. Uh, it's effectively a cartel. Um, mm. So the way that we talk to people about it, the individuals you talk to, especially the younger graduates like myself, super interested. What is this new money? but also very dismissive of it, like how I was initially. Um, but when you're on the trading floor and you're you're sitting there watching the, waiting for the central bank to tell you what's going to happen to the money, um, you start to, when you learn more about what the central bank is doing, uh, there's so much parallel to Bitcoin. So the angle that I understood Bitcoin from was the scarcity angle, the uh, the fixed, unchangeable monetary policy because it's the changing monetary policy that is manipulating and moving markets so much and influencing markets so much and that the banks are monetizing and being subsidized effectively by so much. Um, and then another aspect that interested me about Bitcoin other than the economic side, which is really related to my work, was the uh, censorship free speech side of it too. Um, and that's I, I, I was a little bit naive when I, when I quit my job I didn't think that the banks in Australia and New Zealand were as uh, aggressive with their anti-competitive behavior as what I'd seen overseas. So when I started up a Bitcoin brokerage, we did dollar cost averaging for Bitcoin in Australia. Um, the, <laughs> the pushback from the banks, the treating me like a criminal, the uh, debanking me 10 times, um, the locking up the funds of the company for six months, you know, when we had done everything by the book, we had followed every regulation that they were coming out with, every KYC thing they wanted us to do. Um, but the reality is they are the ones that that clip the ticket. And if you're trying to clip the ticket too, well, you're doubling up on something that they want to, they actually want to be the ones clipping the ticket on Bitcoin, but they want to have the regulation in place that makes it so that it's just them that's doing it. Sorry, there was this crypto saver, your, your business that you started? Yeah, so it's called Crypto Saver. Um, there was another business at a similar time called My Crypto Saver, um, which is different. And then there's another business in the UK that had a website, Crypto Saver, but that was like a total scam. So it's yeah. a bit confusing. What yeah. we did was we only did Bitcoin dollar cost averaging. Um, and that wasn't actually a principled reason because we weren't fully Bitcoin maximalists when we started it. The reason was that starting a business we wanted to focus on Bitcoin and we knew that the cheapest way, if you wanted to actually invest in those other cryptos, the cheapest way is to buy Bitcoin and then take that Bitcoin to a crypto exchange and you can go gamble it there if you want to. You can do whatever you want with your Bitcoin, but it wouldn't have made sense for us to try broker the other ones too. Um, but yeah, Crypto Saver, it lasted about a year and a half before we got to a situation where we would never be able to scale because the only bank account, the only fiat rails we were allowed to have by the system were underneath another company basically as basically a loophole in the system where would be a subsidiary to someone else so would never actually be the complete owner and controller of our business so it didn't really make sense are, are there some challenges there because obviously we have you know 
exchanges, centralized exchanges in New Zealand. Um, however, there has been criticism that they are highly aligned with the banking system here um, in, in many cases. And so your crypto saver business has some real challenges getting banked and yet there's exchanges that are walking around and, and, and selling uh, Bitcoin yeah. and uh, other... Uh, Each of the banks has their play. Yeah. And so in New Zealand, Kiwi Bank has its play. And uh, that New Zealand in particular is such a small market that there is actually a logical reason why they don't want too much competition. They just want to help nurture one business. And then the other banks in New Zealand are all Australian owned and all their plays are in Australia. So New Zealand is only really catered to by one major player, really. But in the in the world of exchanging fiat for Bitcoin, we don't have that much of a mining uh, industry in New Zealand that's generating Bitcoin. So there isn't that much organic uh, supply of Bitcoin for New Zealand dollars. Mm. So most of the Bitcoin in the world is being sold for US dollars, and that all happens overseas. So any service we use in New Zealand is really just a middleman helping you get access to overseas liquidity. And that's the bread and butter of banking. That's the financial rails. You have to go through a fiat financial rail to get to US dollars. So it is the banks that, that gatekeep that. Um, yeah, well, no, absolutely. Absolutely. There's, um, I mean, criticisms have been labelled and, and the names shall not be spoken, but there's you know centralised exchanges that are basically, as you say, just the portals for overseas, um, big, you know, big international exchange liquidity. Um, and that's it. And yet they're still able to slap that nice premium uh, when you're trying to buy from uh, little old New Zealand. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing about that is the premium is so they can fund their business, which is fine. You need to fund your business. But when your business is investing that premium and expanding in the direction of making a casino, mm -hmm. so basically building out the banking systems product suite of equity token offerings, but now you're adding shitcoin token offerings to it. When all that premium you're paying is going to fund that, and now we're five years into the Lightning Network, and you're meant to be a Bitcoin brokerage or Bitcoin service provider, but you don't even help people actually get Lightning Bitcoin and actually use it. I don't like giving those companies a premium because they're not actually investing it into Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, well, it's um, a distortion of um, capital allocation. You know, they've got this kind of moat, um, and then also this kind of capture of narrative. You know, like these centralized exchanges have have a very strong voice in New Zealand, which again is a small country, and so. It only takes a few people, and and uh, they get on the news, and they start talking, and, and then they're, they're the ones that are on, you know, the government advisory boards, and it's easier because they've got a name, and they've got a company, and they've got an address, and all of these things. But as a Bitcoin, it's like, well, I, I said this actually I, when I met with one of the guys from the Reserve Bank at an event. Uh, it was a bit of a, a funny uh, coincidence uh, having a chat with him, and he asked me, "Cody, who are you affiliated with?" And I said, "I'm affiliated with myself. I'm a I'm a Bitcoiner. You know, like, I don't." Yeah. The government's so used to being lobbied by people, and that's the reality. Is the reason like government regulation ends up being captured by by the industry, is because the industry put the effort into lobbying and spending money trying to convince government to change the rules in a direction that favors them. Whereas the individuals, the Bitcoiners, we're so busy just trying to live our life and build things in Bitcoin that we're not trying to actively lobby the government to make rules because we don't need rules to help us. But then the people who are building a business that relies on the rules to protect their moat, they, they, they get those rules put in place to protect them. Yeah. Um, well, that, I mean, lobbying, I mean, even I think Guy on Espinel was doing a bit of an expose on that um, in terms of the, the lobbying in New Zealand is highly unregulated. Like, I think in many countries, there's a lot of sort of legal requirements, you know, <laughs> requirements for how you, uh, you know, you try and build moats like that. But actually in New Zealand, it's super loose. And um, I mean, I don't really follow fiat news anymore, but it's like, what, what capability have they got to just kind of walk up there and, you know, do, do a deal I mean, who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, though, at the end of the day, um, Bitcoin is peer-to-peer. -peer. And so, like, bringing it back to Orange, uh, you're probably similar to me. When you were younger and torrenting, or, you know, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing came out, you know, we used to pay, what, 20 or $30 for a CD with 12 songs on it, and now we could get it all for free digitally, immediately, direct, directly into our iPod or whatever. Uh, um it's crazy that it was because the kids were openly breaking the law, openly willing to do something that was much more convenient, much more efficient, 
and actually at the time wasn't necessarily breaking the law because the laws hadn't caught up yet. But the digital piracy helped revolutionize the whole way that we consume digital content. Now, most people were just happy to pay, for example, Spotify a subscription to have it automatically torrenting every file out there for them, like bringing every file to their phone and making it available to them, streaming it to them. And that industry, the, the music industry, probably wouldn't have gotten to where it is today if it didn't have the young people willing to just uh, use the tools to their advantage to have a better world. And so with Orange, bring it back to Orange, trying to get teenagers to just go out and earn Bitcoin. You don't have to... You don't have to file paperwork with some person in some city that you don't live in to form a company to to just start trading peer to peer with people with Bitcoin because Bitcoin is just this this thing on the internet that exists and no one can actually stop you from receiving it. Um, I'm not trying to encourage people to break whatever laws are in their jurisdiction, but I do think that uh, the more young people play with it and earn it and spend it and just create that economy all around the world, uh, the incumbents will have to just catch up and start using it themselves. And even the incumbent way of funding uh, public works in New Zealand, like you know taxation, that just has to innovate and adapt. Uh, the way El Salvador has done it's quite interesting. They've basically said, you're welcome to earn Bitcoin from anywhere in the world and spend it anywhere in El Salvador. There's no tax implications whatsoever. Just go out and get the Bitcoin and spend it here and stimulate our economy. And the way that we will get a piece of that to help build the public infrastructure to help keep growing our economy is that for the physical places that you're shopping at, the physical stores that we, the local government with the guns, can actually go up and audit and, and check out what they're doing, will require them to do a... Um, a transaction fee, like a GST or a sales tax. That actually means that the government is aligned with the growth of the economy. They want mm. lots of transactions, lots of economy, economic activity happening because they're getting a cut every time. Mm. And they can only enforce that really on physical premises, like the physical buildings. And actually, really, that makes sense because the physical buildings are the ones benefiting from the physical roading infrastructure that the government's building for them. Uh, whereas a digital entrepreneur providing a digital service, uh, you shouldn't really just have to voluntarily hand over cash to someone in your region for protection money. Um, but you'll be spending all that money you're earning if you're doing well in that economy, and that's helping fund the security of that region. So like taxation is going to have to innovate with Bitcoin. That's um, a really powerful idea. And I think you know, riffing on that a little bit, you know, this analogy with file sharing, really it disintermediated, you know, these kind of physical disks and, and this kind of physical media into a digital media. And in a way, we're seeing the same thing here. You know, your your uh, Orange server, your, you know, this game, it's purely virtual. You know, there is no footprint to it. And, it, you know, it can get reset every month or it can get turned off or you know, upgraded and scaled and there's no physical footprint to that. And that's value existing in a dimension. Like it's not even a physical dimension anymore. It's it's like a, in a different place. And so yeah. the brick and mortar um, government and, and, and the guns and batons kind of old school approach no longer applies when you've got this, yeah. this other virtual dimension. Of, it's a whole new economy, yeah. a new layer of economy in the digital world up there in cyberspace or whatever. Um, in the cloud, but uh, I think that that new economy and the potential of it is huge, but it doesn't replace the physical economy. It actually grows the physical economy because as we're all earning more money, creating more services, doing more things in the digital economy, uh, we still need to buy food and we still need to upgrade our own quality of life in the real world where we're actually physically based. Mm. And so it can really drive the economy in the physical world too. Yeah, and and I think the you know, your what you described about the tax situation is also very interesting because it, you know, it historically has been quite a forceful relationship, but that hegemonic negotiation between you know the powers and and the people, um, you know, it can be changed through technology, and so we're seeing that now where, you know, if you're earning in this virtual space, you know, it's actually. Um, there needs to be an opt-in, you know, in terms of the tax obligation, uh, you know, what are you going to do sort of thing. And and that really is a powerful position and it swings the pendulum back into the favour of the people. Um, and especially when you look at, 
I mean, how government money gets spent and how, I mean, again, the road to serfdom, Austrian economics, you know, the government is the worst allocator of capital. And so you think, well, actually, I don't agree with the way they're spending money. I would like to see an audit on the way they're, you know, procuring these projects and managing things. Um, you don't really have the option to opt out of that system currently. You know, you're basically, um, you know, by threat of, of imprisonment or fine, um, forced to kind of comply. And because there's no mechanism for that to self-correct, it's just going to do what it does. Um, but actually, if the governments of the world have to kind of get on board and say, well, look, we really, you know, would like, you know, the, the meat space that you live in to be as best as possible. You know, here's our proposal. What do you think? And it becomes a lot more of a um, mm. of an agreement and, and a compromise type situation as opposed to an all-encompassing um, a money grab. Yeah, it's hard because the government is individuals they're people too um <laughs> the ones who get into power uh, is due to popularity mm -hmm. which is fine because you want someone who cares about their public perception so that they don't uh you know they want to if someone cares about their popularity it's because they're listening to all the feedback they're listening to all the comments out there and they don't want to be unliked they want to be loved uh that's why money is spent so poorly as well is because the loudest complaints can sometimes not have the best solution. So people who are upset and grieving about their current situation um, and they, they fall back to the idea of, well, the state, the government should do something to fix it. That could be, that could be correct. There, there could be an opportunity for the government to help, but their call to action is usually, uh, well, here's our proposal. We want the government to spend money on X, Y, Z. And because their their complaint and their grievance is legitimate and they want help, uh, the government doesn't have the necessarily the original ideas themselves. They they listen to the complaints and they listen to their suggested way of spending money to solve it, and they do that to maintain their popularity. Um, and so that's how most governments eventually become unpopular because they are listening to their base a bit too much and doing policies that aren't necessarily well thought through. And then you just have a change of government who is hopefully listening to the opposition, which is always growing. So it's always like, a, in New Zealand, it's quite interesting that we do kind of always switch between the two kind of sides, but we usually have coalitions. We usually don't have one-party governments. And that was, when you have a one-party government, you are really able to push through whatever it is you want to do without much challenge or pushback. Um, which is interesting because that can be used for really good things where you don't have to get general consensus. You can actually just do what's logical and makes rational sense. And then people after the fact will see from the results that it worked. I think an example of that is uh, Nayib Bukele in El Salvador. Uh, when you, he, he got overwhelming popularity, he's like 90% popularity. So he, and then when they reelected the, um, their version of parliament, he got such a majority that now he can push through any laws he wants. Some people criticize that and call it a dictatorship, but actually the reality is he's a popular politician that's able to now do what he wants based on what his team thinks is right. Doesn't have to get the buy-in of everyone. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting where it's hard to know whether coalitions or one party governments are the most effective way to really grow a economy. And it's hard to know who are they listening to or who are they getting their advice from? And so at the end of the day, I guess I'm trying to get to, it's a long-winded way of saying this, is that it's the individuals that have to call the shots that can make mistakes, no matter how well-intentioned all these people are, they can all make mistakes. And they, they are trying to be popular, they're listening to other people's advice. And so what I like about uh, Orange is the state or the administration isn't trying to make rules for people. It's trying to not have rules so that people can have complete permission that complete freedom to actually be innovative and that's the key crux i'm getting to is that instead of lobbying the state to actively make rules to benefit bitcoin it's almost like i just want the state to ignore bitcoin um, and let it flourish and not create rules because when they create rules they're creating a regulatory capture for the people who benefit from those rules yeah just um developing that a little bit further um are you familiar with the book uh the network state 
uh, by Balaji. So the network state, <laughs> how to starting a country. Are you familiar with it? I haven't read it, but someone recommended it to me literally two days ago in Orange because I was talking about Orange and the state, and they're like, "This is a network state. It's yeah. a network state." I was like, "Okay, I'll have to go read that." So here's an idea for you. Um, I think broadly, and, and what I'm interested in exploring with this podcast. Uh, larger transformations that are taking place. So obviously Bitcoin, there's an economic transformation, but also, I mean, quite clearly we're entering a new era of uh, politics, of disinformation, of post-truth. You know, I mean, we've seen a post-modern era, but now we're in the post-truth era where nothing even makes sense. And, and some people call it clown world, but really you flick on the TV, you know, what is that? And, and it literally doesn't make sense. And so, you know, rationality, logic breaks down in the face of that. And arguably politics kind of falls into that same thing where it's like you know who are these people they're just sound bites and twitter you know six second sort of clips there's no substance to it and i wonder if we can bring this back to bitcoin and we think okay well what is the base layer okay so the, the politicians that you know these you know brick and mortar um you know these these physical buildings don't have presence in, in the virtual space they try to but they really can't do it and so they have jurisdiction over over meat space but by being so all-encompassing and trying to micromanage everyone's lives, they've, they've kind of bloated the base chain of government. And so think of it, it looks like they're the Ethereum of, of a political ideology, right? Yeah. Whereas if we were to run the Bitcoin scenario, so what would a Bitcoin government look like? You know, I think there's right now a really powerful uh, discourse happening you know, around the world, you know, about the different kind of options. We've now got optionality around talking about what government could be. And there's obviously, you know, monarchists, anarchists, all these different kinds of labels. But I think if you were to really boil it down, what are the key functions in, with Bitcoin? You know, you've got 21 million, you've got the halvenings, you've got these kind of key mechanisms that are unchangeable aspects. What are the unchangeable kind of minimum requirements for government in things like freedom, um, person, you know, private property, these kinds of, you know, these kinds of ideas? Everything or does out Bitcoin of, achieve all that? Yeah. Like <laughs> and then abstract everything else out. Don't the government, you know, you're trying to, you know, you're trying to tell me how, you know, what I can and can't do with my business on the base layer. You know, don't don't do that. Leave that to layer two. Right, which, uh, and if you follow the network state, you know, and, and these kind of ideas that you're exploring with Orange, I mean, it's all going to be in the cloud. We're going to have factories and, and you know, manufacturing happening in the real world, but the actual innovation and ide ideas and IP are going to be generated digitally. Um, and so let that be. You know, there's no role for government in that virtual space. Yeah, it's interesting topic, right? Like um, the network state. Yeah, I think that government, like you said, like what it is, what it, is it that they should be setting the parameters or framework or structure? What topics, what areas should they be covering? And like the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is that we realize that it's assets, it's wealth, it's money that needs to be at the base layer fair. It needs to be the ultimate fair thing that can't be gamed by anyone, can't be uh, corrupted or captured or controlled by anyone or influenced by anyone individually. And so now that we've distributed and decentralized the money, um, as you said, everything else is like a layer two on top. And so government, like government, it's like I live in an apartment building. So I understand the need for having someone to actually do the work like there is maintenance required on the building <laughs> how do we coordinate for that to happen well all the tenants pitch in money to what's called a body corporate here in new zealand and that's an entity that's owned by the owners of the building and run by the owners of the building but it's still a committee that you've just delegated the responsibility for the day-to-day -day decisions of you know which plumber to hire if there's a leak in the common area of the building or which company to hire to clean the windows. Not every individual in the apartment building wants to make be involved in that decision. So scaling that up to a whole country, there is still like a need to have someone making some of these decisions on behalf of us, and we're all just pitching in money for them to do it. But the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is that when the money itself is decentralized and distributed and can't be corrupted, you don't have to trust those people that much because you could always move. Uh, and that makes government more local. So if you don't like the decisions being made in your city, you can move to another city. If you don't 
and you can do that between countries although during the covid era the war that the world is in right now it it appears in our mind like we can't but you absolutely can get up and leave your country the gov all the governments in every country in the world right now have mass advertising slash propaganda encouraging people not to leave because they are all conscious that we are free individuals and we can leave um so yeah like governments they they also want to motivate us to actually be productive citizens and help build this country and they not necessarily have the best ideas for that but one of the best ideas ever is for them to stop uh being involved in a system that creates unfairness like it, it is the money being a bit corrupt or unfair that demotivates so many people uh and stops them from putting in the effort to try build wealth oh, so on that on that note so um so a couple of things there so yeah localism you know city states um smaller locations um being independent of each other something really powerful about that only possible on hard money really though because the New Zealand dollar effectively in you know, a couple of islands here in the South Pacific you know in a, in a global you know we don't have a say that there is a global fiat system and we're part of that um, however on, on say the gold standard back in the day or on a Bitcoin standard you know gold is gold no matter who you are and or how big or how small you are and so um, you can have pretty much the MVP which is, is maybe towns or cities or, or even smaller um, can fully function um, and their money is just as good as anyone else's because they're on the same standard. If they if they grow too quickly and grow their wealth too fast and the rest of the world sees it, because it's real wealth, it's real gold, um, or it's real Bitcoin in the current example, there's still an increasing security risk because there is always people in the world that want to steal from others. And so that is where, uh, uh, while the local government and the cities are kind of the way of the future in terms of regulation and, and behavior and how to how people should behave it's up to their local government because when it's local you have more influence over it you can change it much quicker but there is still that overarching idea of well the defense of the whole nation in defense yeah. and in our case you know we have to use politics international politics to help defend our nation because we don't necessarily have the gunpowder or the manpower to defend it and so that does create that kind of it's hard for me to imagine there not being that that global big governments that still exist like you know the big empires like there's still defense contractors that are competing with each other to defend these regions but i guess you could say if the world was at peace you wouldn't need to have security but the moment everyone stops thinking about their security is right when they're at risk the most from someone who is thinking about um uh attacking like you don't even you never know what people are planning yeah well i mean i think so firstly like a, a meta uh, topic that to that would be these are really important discussions and these are for the first time they're actually something that can be actuated you know actualized in, in the real world and so that it's it's a muscle that we haven't exercised uh, for a long time outside of you know writing science fiction or something so uh, th there's a really important role for these kind of discussions around what th the thing could be uh, but more specifically to the defense point um i guess there's two potential threat models one is the you know the the, the americans or the russians you know coming in and, and trying to take it um the other one would be these kind of marauding um you know non-nation state aligned uh, groups uh, both of which are, are problematic however coming back to bitcoin unlike gold you know it's very difficult to confiscate and so um you, you know you've got your your 12 words you've got your multi-sig it's it's not going to get taken and they have to kill you to, and, and even then you know you maybe you don't even have the ability to give them the keys um because uh, it's the multi-sig you know i think an example that has always been with me throughout my bitcoin journey because this person is a similar age to me and has similar interests to me um an example of how you can still be deprived of your freedom is like ross Ulbrick with the silk road hmm. like he made a website he wasn't the one dealing in things on the website he just let people trade with each other and what did they end up trading well the items that are really difficult to obtain in your country so in new zealand cannabis is illegal but it's used a lot for medicinal purposes so one of the main ways to get it in new zealand is to use one of those online free markets or darknet markets like the silk road and there are so many of them now so he started something that is real that's continued to exist but because he started it and because he started it in a country that 
isn't very free at all, has the highest incarceration rate in the world, the US. He has spent 10 years of his life now deprived of his freedoms, and he has another double life sentence ahead of him. Mm. So he's they permanently locked him away. Now, um, that doesn't really, you know, having a government to protect you from enemy governments and their armies is good, but it's also you need to be protected from your own government. And his wealth, his Bitcoin is still protected. They can't confiscate that from him, but they can make an example out of someone if they wanted to and so yeah yeah. well that's sort of a i guess a a a a third model for for the threat there but i guess you know who's the big bad wolf who's going to come you know like if it's not the government you know is is it some kind of you know is it um you know i think 1984 is it eurasia you know like who's coming to take my bitcoin um I don't know, man. Like in a Bitcoin world, like is that yeah. is that even feasible? I mean, this is the utopianism coming through, but you know, can they can they actually take it, or can they only just try and destroy the base layer mm. um, and lock themselves off from actually trading with you? Yeah, they can't. That's what's great about Bitcoin, right? The security. So bringing it to Orange is that you build your home in Orange, right? You 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 get all your little assets. You go get your guns. You get all this cool loot. You build up this big base, and then what happens is someone comes along with rocket launchers and blows their way into it and steals all your stuff. Yeah. Um, the lesson people are learning very quickly is, ah, oh, well, if I had sold my stuff for Bitcoin or converted it into Bitcoin, if I had, if I had gone out and earned that blood and get, traded that in for Bitcoin, and withdrawn the Bitcoin to my own custody. It doesn't matter when I log back on and find that my base has been destroyed because the raiders didn't actually get the valuable thing, which was my savings. So the wealth that you're accruing in your base that's spread across various items, like let's say in this game, something that's quite valuable is a really good quality gun because they're quite hard to make and they're quite hard to find, but they're really useful if you want to go out and do fun things with them. There's no point having 10 AK-47s, for example. (laughs) Why not sell the extra ones you don't need to other people? And then you could get the Bitcoin, withdraw it, and then you're not as upset when you get raided. And that's what kids like these 15, 16 year olds are learning quite quickly is like Bitcoin, even within this simulated game environment, Bitcoin is providing them with that idea of saving, like that checkpoint, saving their progress. So it's not such a big deal when they get wiped out and they feel like they lost everything because actually they didn't. The things that they, the progress they made, they were able to then convert that into Bitcoin and save it. Yeah, I like the idea of the checkpoint and the save save point. You, yeah, you kind of that, that's bringing it back to this this question about the state and the government and motivating the population. The reason the population is so demotivated is because everyone is aware that they were scammed by the fiat currency. Um, but this, it's not really a scam. It's it's to be expected when when a company like a startup is struggling, they issue more equity and dilute existing equity holders. That's what the government does. When the government is struggling because it's yeah, it's, a, it's spent money poorly and no one's willing to lend it any more money, it borrows money from itself, i.e. Uh, it prints money. But what that has the effect of is diluting the value of every dollar. So it's like diluting the equity in a startup. And the people who got burned were anyone who had saved up dollars in New Zealand, Kiwi dollars, um, anyone who had saved them. It's effectively the same as if the government came to everyone's bank account and took 20% of the money and removed it. But because that's so politically unpopular, the easier way is just to dilute the value of the money by printing more of it and lending it to themselves. Um, And we can argue all day about whether it was actually needed uh, because COVID, while being extremely serious and you know, had to be dealt with somehow, did the government, the it had to fund a lot of things because it was the one locking down the economy. It wasn't COVID that locked down the economy. So that's where, you know, a lot of debate could happen. Well, that's that's quite recent. But I mean, the reality is there's always been inflation. So even There's when, always a when, reason to print money. Yeah, there's always been a reason, man. And it, it didn't really matter. Um, they'll, they'll come up with one. And so you're right, you know, the whiskey's getting watered down and um, everyone's money's losing purchasing power. But because it's just that little bit more abstracted away. I mean, I, I, I still get them taking 20% of my the money out of my bank account, but that's um, uh, that's tax. But um, the, the the other tax of inflation, which is more pernicious, um, is unseen. And, and you don't, you don't unless you're looking carefully and sort of like really staring at it, you don't see it happen because it happens 
slower it's over these periods of months and years as opposed to one day you know it's just gone um it's the yeah and the government the state has responded to the public's feedback about inflation uh they they have to be transparent about it like they the government that what we have built the government over decades to be what it is today and the cpi is a measure of inflation now obviously that can be a little bit manipulated but in general the idea is that okay sure we're devaluing their money but uh to keep everything fair what about if we peg your salary increases every year to the inflation rate so you actually get an increase in salary so you're still even that's good in principle that idea of oh yeah that that makes sense but why why should we do it that way <laughs> because that is so bad because so many people do not get raises in in line with inflation or they get the raise but it's a year after the dilution events happened so everything is already 20 percent more expensive and that raise takes them a whole nother year to earn that salary increase basically it's like we've got this really complex system with all these really complex things to try and make it fairer but it would just be so much fairer if people just understood that well this is also where the central bank does try to communicate this sometimes is that uh, new zealand dollars are not for saving um for fiat currency us dollars all fiat currencies are not an instrument that can be used for saving the people telling you it can are the private companies the banking cartel uh, and they're giving you interest rates on your savings accounts they call it you know a savings account it is absolutely not a savings account it is lending money to a private company at an interest rate that's always pretty much in my lifetime but i'm sure back in the day it might be different but in my lifetime it's always been lower than the real inflation rate so you're actually losing money um the the government so it's like the wrong tool for the job yeah the fiat currency is a good tool for medium of exchange before we had bitcoin it's, it was a useful tool it, it helped create the global economy we have now and the digital economy that we do have now um but it's not a useful tool for helping people build wealth and save wealth and the average person doesn't actually want to have to even think about how to do that because when every time they do think about it they get scammed they go and invest in some company that steals their money or they go invest in some property that ends up not appreciating value like they thought it would um and so they some people just fall back to just saving the cash in the bank which is where they're then getting a little bit kind of robbed on the side a little bit yeah quite quite but a that, lot yeah. <laughs> yeah but that's where uh bitcoin like complements fiat currency because bitcoin is a different tool for a different job it's savings yeah but it's also a medium of exchange so it disrupts the medium exchange part of the fiat currency too um yeah yeah <laughs> I, I, I think what's powerful is that it gives a, a place where you can stand from which to observe, observe the existing system and I'm, i remember vaguely to you know the 2008 um you know crisis and, and all of that and new zealand was a little bit insulated compared to the us but still you know it was something you know we learned about and, and you, you sort of saw it around you and i remember you know interest rates roughly at that time were, were a lot higher maybe maybe six seven eight percent in, in the bank but it seems like ever since then and, and that was the genesis period of, of bitcoin ever since then it's gone into this ridiculous territory where again clown world you know interest interest rate money in the bank um good as gold none of this stuff matt you know these these phrases even that we use you know gold price has been suppressed for for decades mm -hmm. like well the interest rate at the bank has over time gotten lower generally because the banks over time have have become part of the state they've worked through the regulation guarantees insurance on all their deposits they've managed to turn it into what you could call in finance a risk-free investment uh say a deposit at the bank because the government is ensuring that they'll give you back that money but they're only ensuring the the nominal value the fiat value they're not ensuring the actual real value of that money um and so it's like interest rates have fallen and the problem that the world was in before covid not the problem but the reality was uh the economy global economy was slowing down and uh, interest rates were going actually negative in some parts of the world because there was a lot of cash out there that wasn't circulating it was just being stored and the more demand there is to store it somewhere the lower the interest rates are because is you, you can accept a lower and lower interest rate so are, are you saying the virus didn't come out of the lab in wuhan it came out of the european central bank and the federal reserve <laughs> well, i wasn't even thinking about COVID anymore i was thinking about um that was the 
uh, the excuse to cut rates so low that it scared people into spending their money. Yeah. And that happens every 10 years. Um, and it's going to like, we're going to have negative interest rates eventually on fiat currency. That's actually what happens the moment the CBD, CBDC comes out, which kind of already exists, but the moment it's more formalized, that process of having your fiat actually being cut. So in New Zealand, for example, it's like the U S the central bank and the major banks are kind of one entity effectively kind of now, not really, but, that money, your deposits, are going to be now basically with the central bank, if not already guaranteed by the government. When interest rates go negative, it's just another way of saying, use it or lose it. It's like when an airline says, if you don't use your reward miles within a year, you're going to lose them. And the government wants to be able to have that ability because it wants to be able to turn on the taps of stimulating the economy when it wants to. And that's coming, that, that eventually happens. But one of the reasons it actually happens isn't just the central bank saying rates are now lower. It's the event that scares people into locking up their money with the government and buying those government bonds, which drives the interest rates down. And the event is, you know, you're worried about your retirement. Well, the world's turning to shit. You better lend your money to the government now and everyone piles into government bonds. Or you're worried about earning a return on investment over the next three years when we're telling you that the world's going to, be completely stagnant because we're locking it all down because there's a virus or whatever it is. Well, people rush to lend their money to the government and that does drive interest rates down. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that. I, I'm signed up to the Reserve Bank uh, of New Zealand's uh, newsletter um, just to keep abreast of, of the shenanigans. And uh, I got a little update here around uh, deposit takers legislation and how that's been modernized. Um, I think New Zealand was lagging for, uh, compared to other countries around sort of insuring people's money in the bank. Um, and this, uh, uh, you know, I think, yeah, here we go. Um, 200,000, I think, or 100,000. 100, 100,000, yeah. So in the yeah. event uh, a, deposit a deposit taker fails, uh, um, they'll be eligible for up to 100 grand per depositor per institution. So that is effectively like in the US when a couple of the banks went under recently, um, they kind of fast-tracked that idea of guaranteeing not all deposits, but they did this thing where the banks – they take your money and then they go and invest it in bonds. It's into the government bonds, for example. And those are meant to be marked to market. They're meant to reflect that as interest rates rise from 2% to 6%, if you locked up your money at 2%, but now the interest rate is 6%, if you want to get your money out of that bond, you actually have to accept less than what you put into it. If you put $100 into it, you can't get your if you have you can get your hundred dollars back if you wait until the end of the period. Let's say it's a ten year bond. If you wait ten years, you get the hundred dollars back. But because interest rates have gone up so much, all the new bonds being issued have like a six seven like these huge interest rate coupons on them. If you want your money out today because you need cash today, you have to let the next investor have a similar rate of return as what's available in the market. So you have to sell it for less than a hundred dollars. So they're paying less than a hundred for it, and that extra that they make at the end of the period effectively gives them that equivalent interest rate to what the current new bonds are. So what I'm trying to get at is what they did in the US was you can get basically, I think it was part, you can get $100 for every $100 you have in a bond, no matter what its actual market value is, you can get that $100 cash right now by just giving it back to the government or pledging it in part of a repo deal or something. Hmm. Yeah, so I sometimes describe what's happening with the banking. I call them a cartel just to be cheeky, but with the banking institutions, uh, it's effectively nationalization. It's like the post office um, all being consolidated into one post office and being part of the government. Fiat banking is all being consolidated into the government and the CBDC kind of formalizes that. But when I say banking, I mean the act of holding New Zealand dollars as a deposit and just using it as a medium of exchange. That's kind of been uh, nationalized. But banking itself, there's a whole bunch of other products and services around that, and that's not being nationalized. So when you go to spend your dollars and you want to invest it, the brokerage is competitive amongst the banks. It's very competitive, actually, the brokerage. So there's sort of a privilege there to be in that gilded group who can actually hold the NZD. Yeah, well, um, exactly. <laughs> but that could be what the CBDC disrupts. Um, so uh, the probably most controversial opinion I have in Bitcoin that will get me cancelled is I'm not as afraid of a CBDC as everyone else is. 
I guess it's because we're from a small country where our CBDC is quite local to us. Um, I am afraid of a one world global US dollar CBDC because that's the ultimate surveillance state control, how you can spend fiat. But if you think about it for New Zealand, it's basically just saying um, that brokerage issue we brought up earlier of how to buy Bitcoin. Well, we've got to go through those gatekeepers with, who currently are the CBDC, that banking group, which is actually 80% Australian owned. Um, the, the, the four major banks, Australian, and then the fifth bank's New Zealand. Um, once there's a CBDC, it's a digital token. It's actually US dollar tether. Once we have a New Zealand dollar tether, once we have that, New Zealanders will benefit massively with their existing New Zealand dollars that they're earning. They can spend that more globally a lot easier, in my opinion. Um, if we like, if we took New Zealand dollar, put it on the liquid network on Bitcoin and made New Zealand dollar tether, it would be super useful for me as a New Zealander earning New Zealand dollars, spending New Zealand dollars here. Um, and then the the criticism of CBDC is the ability to censor the payments. But when you view the world as Bitcoin exists, because it does exist and you can't get rid of Bitcoin, it's a different system that, because it can be censored, it will be censored. And that's because they're trying to do something different with it. So that's how they give out benefits in New Zealand or um, you know unemployment benefit or injury benefits. If you are struggling to find work in New Zealand, the government will give you money each month or each week to help you get by. But they won't give you real money. They're not going to give you Bitcoin. They're going to give you their token, their CBDC. And they just want to ensure that while they're propping you up and helping you through that tough time, they just want to ensure that you only spend it on the necessities, food, you know, to, and accommodation, right? They don't want you to go spend it at the liquor store, for example because that's where a lot of New Zealand's <laughs> money ends up. Um, so, so it's like... <laughs> yeah, riffing on that though, um, that's actually a really good point because that, I mean, that's one of the criticisms of, of CBDCs is that, you know, it's programmable, you know, you could turn it off for, for certain things. But if you flip it and you run the scenario that we're living in, in the network state, we're living in, a, in, in you know, cities, local, local government, um, there's also reward that can be paid out in hard money so Bitcoin. So I'm living, you know, I, I live in, in a place I really like. I want to contribute. I get paid for being part of that place because I've got Bitcoin holdings and they release that to people who've been citizens for a couple of years or whatever. Um, so I get real money out if I'm productive in. Whereas if you're down on your luck, you've, you've had some issues. I, you know, I do think there's, there is some benefit in, in having a system that helps support people who are vulnerable or have had issues um, that mean that they're not able to uh, contribute straight away to the economy. But the way they get paid out isn't through hard money. It's through this this token. Um, exactly. It's like um, yeah. It's like if you think of New Zealand like Disneyland, uh, it's basically like if there was just a, a loyalty point slash token that you can only use within New Zealand, really, like it because it's created by New Zealand to redeem at New Zealand services by the government, and it creates it does create that social credit system. That's what it is. It's a social credit system. But the idea is that people are less likely to take advantage of that social credit system when it is heavily restricted and can only be used for those necessities. And so that's probably what it will only be used for. But any individual in this world, in this, even though we're in a walled garden of New Zealand or Disneyland, because we can never be stopped from saving our wealth in Bitcoin, we just see the fiat currency as a tool we can use to earn and accumulate wealth, but not by accumulating fiat currency. It's just the tool that we then use to buy Bitcoin or we use to buy goods and services or merchandise that we sell for Bitcoin. Um, and every time we move it into Bitcoin, we're actually saving it. Yeah. Um, and just yeah. sort of riffing on that a bit more, I mean, this is new territory for me, but um, you'll be familiar with Gresham's Law. You know, um, bad money drives out good. And there's this sort of game theory that, you know, the back in the day that you'd take the silver silver coins out of the, of the, of the um, you know, the, the cashier yeah. would, you know. Well, in this scenario, uh, the, the CBDC that let's say can only be used on food, it's actually going to be the, the big supermarkets that the government regulates that will be forced to accept it. Yeah. But if I'm running a local butcher, I might just say, no, I don't want to accept that. I want Bitcoin or I'll encourage people to pay me in hard money by giving Bitcoin as a discount. But that's where the government steps in with its legal tender law, which forces everyone to accept their CBDC or their fiat currency. Yeah. So, well, sorry, I, I'm just wondering, though, running that scenario out, is there, 
is there a situation where the game theory kind of you know i think you know the maximalist game theory is that yeah you know bitcoin is, is always going to win it's the you know the silver coins being taken out of the draw but in this case could we see um a renewed interest with localism being the other component here where actually people are like yeah look there is this other you know nz you know the, the wellington <laughs> digital currency or whatever yeah. it's the it's kind of the meat space cyberspace thing yeah. where bitcoin has absolutely already won the internet money race it's the only one that's actually internet cash so it's the only one that people are going to actually use on the internet in the long run that's where the aggression law really is happening mm. right now on the internet it's driving out all the crypto like why would i pay for a microservice of like computing power with ethereum if it means i have to first buy the ethereum with my bitcoin and then spend the ethereum to do it why not just accept bitcoin directly mm. so all the internet services the future economy which is huge much probably bigger than the physical economy the digital economy layer two digital economy layer two, yeah that's definitely like bitcoin dominates right but in meat space because of that issue of how do we pay for physical security how do we pay for infrastructure and how do we you know collaborate a bit in meat space we have this state that we've already built over decades how does it innovate and adapt to this digital world well, it can focus on what its its strengths are, which are also its weaknesses of why it fails in the digital world. But its strength is that it can uh, have this currency that it can control. And so it can become what it already is, which is that unit that people use and think about here. But it's not, um, yeah, it's not, it's not what people are going out to try and really earn and save. It's just like, it becomes more of an actual statistical measurement unit which is what it is trying to be where you don't you know when probably when you're a kid as well you thought a million dollar home was you know a mansion yeah. <laughs> in new zealand for the listeners a million dollar home is no longer a mansion it's any um, it's, it's the average house price is a million dollars man like yeah so like kids get kind of scammed it's like santa claus they get told yeah one day you'll be a millionaire well once they start thinking in terms of sats and Bitcoin, and they're striving for a, something that's actually a real metric, a real standard of measurement that doesn't change over the years, they can actually start to strive for the right goal. Um, when you're just striving for quantity of fiat, when you just want to have a million dollars, well, by the time you get it, it's not worth what you thought it was anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, I, I, yeah. I wonder. Um, I wonder if there's something here as well. You know, you and I are of this generation. I mean, I'm assuming you remember 2008 vaguely from from your younger years, but we're of a generation who grew up through that, but weren't old enough necessarily to really be you know sort of more of our parents' problem. You know, um, and I'm wondering if. You're, you know, you're, 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 with Orange and with some of these kind of emerging trends we're seeing with like Gen Z and this kind of reaction to, to work and, and kind of a search for meaning post COVID that we're going to see a huge generational shift happen, you know, an avalanche of, of young people coming out who are just like, yeah, like what what's a bank? You know, just like you and I might be like, well, what is a TV? Yeah. You know, what is the radio? You know, you want to listen to yeah. the radio? Like, oh, you mean you mean cigarettes aren't good for me? I think that was our yeah. <laughs> our generation's one was like it's appalling when we look back and see the advertising that the that claimed to be medical advice saying that doctors recommend cigarettes but it was all just fake advertising really and that's what's happening today with people saying that like putting your money in the bank and investing it in their kiwi saver and all that stuff is all super safe and not risky yeah. Well, um, it seems really yeah. like matter, matter out of place when you, you see young people and like people I know who are like, yeah, man, like they've just got their first job and they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm on sharesies. I'm like, bro, what are you doing? Like, Yeah. Well, it, I guess it's, it, it is uh, a necessary, it's a necessary step because if we accept that the fiat currency can't be used for savings, then what we're saying is people need to learn how to invest their money. Um well, now we're understanding that actually we can just have better money, which is Bitcoin that you can just hold and save and it won't you won't be required to go out and speculate it. But I can see why people who don't understand Bitcoin yet uh, to get away from the inflation and the failures of fiat as a savings tool, they go out and they invest it. And that's what I did. That's what I was excited about when I got into university too. And that's actually like still a thing that we need is we need the money to be... So while Bitcoin is savings... We still need people to be spending their Bitcoin um, because we do want the economy to actually grow and we want 
things that to be built and money needs to be spent for things to be built. Um, but the nature in which that they're coordinating to do it, the token, the equity, the security that they're using, the, the state has tried very hard to make that fair and regulated where those companies have to disclose everything they're doing. But that still is ripe with fraud and lots of failures. Most companies fail. Um, and that's what secure, uh, the crypto token economy was as well. It was basically a completely unregulated version of that. And we saw just how disastrous capital allocation was when there were no requirements that the people raising capital had to actually be accountable for what they're spending the money on. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's like we're still going to have that with like security tokens, but they're going to be done in ways that are more transparent, like the ones that are on Liquid are quite interesting. Um, but that that is a trusted investment, right? That's a that's trusting someone. Any security token is is trust. That's why it's called a security. And that's why it's regulated. Um, but the mindset of people should be that's not that's your spending money. You're spending money when you invest it in a company, but you're not saving money. You're saving money when you store it as Bitcoin. Yeah, and and I think that that's what I was getting. At. Obviously, I mean, young people were. I mean, they have no choice. They have to find a way to, to, to save, so to speak. And that in this case has become, you know, shares ease or these kind of, you know, easy stock, you know, um, apps that you can just buy and, 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 and mess around. Yeah, like Robin Hood in the US. Yeah, you know, and um, that this is, this is a phenomenon where people aren't necessarily aware of the reason why they have to do that. Um, but that's the only real, you know, use case that's open to them because maybe they're too young to be able to buy a house. So it's like, where else are you going to put your money? And so there's this... Uh, kind of degenerative effect where it actually creates um, you know speculation on on you know ETFs and things that don't really have productive value um, and the actual ability for someone to understand a company deeply and invest in that I mean that's not really rewarded anymore it's a full-time job yeah. um, and so <laughs> in a way I'm wondering whether orange and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering you know if there's similar projects out there that are operating maybe in, in different areas of that kind of emerging trend towards younger people gen z who are coming up into this brave new world post covid you know and so you and i post 2008 and, and we had it good for a little while but it still kind of sucked but these kids, kids they really have nothing and you're seeing that you know places like china you know the work culture um, i was watching a video on that like 996 you know nine till nine six days a week <laughs> these emerging kind of kind of effects of inflation of shrinkflation of just you know the end game i, I guess of fiat are coming out and people are just sort of saying no i don't want that anymore you know the the allure of the hustle and i'm going to make it is kind of worn off and people are man i just want to take it easy um well, i mean that's probably concerning for the government who's the people lobbying them are the businesses that need human labor to, to function and productive human labor yeah. i think new zealand's been pretty good at trying to set a, a scene where companies workers have rights obviously yeah. but also companies are trying to innovate on how to make people more productive without necessarily making them work like a dog like a slave um, with the whole a lot of companies in New Zealand are now trialing the four-day work week like things like that or really happy to support remote work like the future post-covid is actually very bright for workers rights and uh, young people have also learned that you don't have to hitch your whole career and your whole livelihood on one company it's actually naive and almost foolish of you to have assumed that. Um, and that's probably an error with the education system and university trying to tell people that you have to get a graduate job and then work your way up at that firm and that's going to pay for your retirement. Mm. Uh, young people now realize that they have to focus on their skill set and improving themselves and their marketability and their ability to work for multiple employers. Is, is That's a huge change from when we were younger. Yeah. And that's what a lot of people are doing now is that the longer you can remain independent and contract to multiple employers and continue to upskill yourself, the more value you can really accrue. And then now with Bitcoin, the beautiful thing is you don't have to find an income that will provide for you for the next 50 years of your life or whatever. You don't have to try and find an employer that you think is going to be around 50 years in a stable job that's not going to get disrupted. You just have to focus on being really productive yourself while you're young and able to be productive and just accumulate the wealth that you're earning and actually just making sure you're saving it. <laughs> like Not spending it all. You definitely spend some on what you'd like, but also save some. And then with Bitcoin, that's the beautiful thing is that you actually have that 
that real nest egg, not that fake nest egg of the government pension bullshit that by the time you earn it, it's not worth anything anyway. Um, it's like this nest egg of Bitcoin is wealth and there'll be a point when you stop accumulating it and you start thinking about the life you have left and how you can spend it to pay for the rest of your life without relying on other people, without relying on a state to take care of you. You took care of yourself by working really hard when you're young and Bitcoin took care of you by actually saving that money for you. Um, you didn't have it all rug pulled from you once you retired. Like the COVID crash in the market, right, is actually devastating for boomers. Um, many boomers now entering retirement, uh, leading up to retirement and everything rallied and they thought, sweet, my home, a million dollar home, sweet. I've got my stocks, they're all up 20%. Well, at the moment, they're not. And at the moment, most boomers are heading into retirement. And that's that age group, that population that we have in New Zealand, that distribution, we've got that huge boomer population, what's well, around the world generally. Um, that's now a burden for the state to fund that pension, yeah. to pay for people who are able to build their own retirement. Yeah. And I think along those lines um, as well, just exploring my time in Japan, one thing that really stu stood out to me is just, um, I mean, they had quite a serious uh, stock market crash in 1989, which sort of led to this, you know, lost generation, they call it, which sort of fully encompassed me and all of my friends. Um, and so the people who are enjoying life in a way, you know, quote unquote, are all older people. And so one thing that I, I enjoy about New Zealand is, you know, you can be 25 and you can go scuba diving, you can, you know, go mountain climbing, you know, you can have a sport, you can have a hobby, maybe you have a nice car, like it's still very accessible here. Whereas in Japan, anyone who's doing any of those nice things is at least 50. Um, and it's because that whole generation from 89 through to today got wiped out and uh, working away in a uh, deflationary, shrinkflation type environment where houses and everything is getting more and more shit. Um, and, you know, your wages are just kind of stagnant. And I wonder if this future you just described uh, leads to almost a change in society where it's like young people, they work hard, and then they're able to actually chill out a little bit. There leads to more of a like a, you know, and you know, invest in arts and culture and kind of more of the the soft soft aspects of a society. Mm -hmm. And not, that's cool. and not everyone is just an Uber Eats delivery guy slaving away yeah. to pay his rent in in an, in an old house. You know, like which is sort of this other situation. You know, kind of future vision of you know you'll be in the pod and you eat the bugs and you know this kind of meme, meme <laughs> at this point. But so I, I don't want that. I, I want to be able to you know take it easy and you know yeah. you work hard you do your time but then why aren't we reaping the rewards of technology and advancing and, yeah. and the accumulation of savings i think related to that you mentioned like the generation when the huge stock market crash happened in japan and and the other ones have happened around the world since and how that can take uh especially in japan take a very long time to if you were fully invested then for those investments to get back to their high water mark right the thing about Bitcoin is that it, it absolutely has huge crashes. It has 80% crashes every four years. But it's only ever taken every four years to get back to its high watermark again. It's actually a cycle. And it's exactly like you say, like uh, when Bitcoin is bubbling, the people who have already been working really hard during the bear market, stacking sets and being productive, their, their savings has now got much more purchasing power and so it becomes cyclical where during the bull market, they're spending more Bitcoin and stimulating the whole global economy. And during the bear market, they're more biased towards trying to earn Bitcoin and being productive. But everyone's at different stages. The early Bitcoiners have gone through many cycles. And while they still might reduce their spending in a bear market, they generally have Bitcoin to spend. Um, whereas new people who just got involved in 2021 they will be feeling right now disheartened because they've just lost 80% of their savings. But if they have the right mindset of Bitcoin's a long-term savings thing, now they're being really productive and they're all getting to work and they're all trying to stack sets. And then it's not that they retire every four years. It's more that their spending habits will increase every four years. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was going to say that. Um, you've got me thinking here. Like this this really is a thing because you've got obviously the, business, the boom bust cycle and how that has been hijacked and manipulated through the fiat system to basically wipe everyone out who's uh, you know on the lower end um, and then you know reaccumulate at the top end but almost in a way that this fixes that because 
yeah, you're in the bear market. You know that you need, you know, stack as many sats as you can, son. Um, build a business, be productive, learn some skills. You've got a four-year window to do that. And it's not it's not a 10-year cycle. It's not a, a generational cycle. It's four years. It's a very achievable 1,200 days mm. to get yourself sorted. Um, and then, you know, the next cycle comes in the next bull run or whatever. And you can, you know, if you wanted to, you could spend that or you could opt to, to skip it. And, and wait for another four years. Exactly. And yeah, depending on your age, right? It, so if you're a young person, yeah. you probably could spend a decade working hard trying to stack your sets. But if you've already gotten older and already spent that decade stacking your sets, it might just be that you spend more in the bull market years and you spend less in the bear market years. And that's really... <laughs> The, the, this is happening on a global scale right now, and the reason the global economy feels so um, depressing <laughs> is because no one is spending money right now. Not many people are, really. Um, everyone's got their mindset of they need to save, partly because we all see the cheap assets out there that we're trying to save, like Bitcoin, but also because we're being told um, you know, not to go out and take a risk and not to go out and build something because you need to tighten your belt and pay off the money you already owe if you have someone with a mortgage, for example. Mm. And that's quite depressing. And it's like, it's cyclical because it goes the other way too. In the bull market, spending is so loose. People are so bad with their money that ridiculous assets, ridiculous investments somehow raise the most money. They've got the best advertising, basically, the best marketing. That's what the entire kind of crypto security space really was was just really good advertising um and yeah yeah every bull market even experienced people are gonna get uh attracted to a bad investment which is unfortunate well i, I think that may change though i mean we're seeing some of the sec regulation in there which is coming downstream and uh, uh, you know unregulated securities they always were um and maybe that's the end of them at least from a regulatory perspective Certainly an end of the uh, brazen advertising of them by like celebrity endorsements and how easily that, like with Orange, I'm speaking to teenagers almost every day and they they don't, when you're young, you don't actually have the mental capacity to really verify everything, right? You're still learning the basics of life. What they can do is see a really friendly, familiar face on Instagram or Twitter on a tweet saying something positive about something and they trust that you know everyone has to learn don't trust verify but young people uh, most people uh, abstract that to oh well i'll just trust the people that i think i that other people trust the popular people and that's where the the lack of regulation around crypto securities really burnt a lot mm. of people and and the people who promoted them uh, should have known better but at the same time it's like humans are humans right you pay them to say something they'll say something yeah well look man um this has been very interesting thank you um uh, been great it's been great to learn about orange and and your work uh with that project um uh if people want to follow you find out more about orange or they want to join in and, and um and, and and join the world like how, how can they, they they check in yeah so orange mart's uh website is orange mart um orangem.art so it's orange mart with a dot between the m and the art um or at the orange mart on twitter i'm at james Vigi. um and yeah just if you're interested in or if you're like uh interested in esports that's kind of the direction we're going with this if you're interested in com competition but also interested in learning more about bitcoin in a fun environment that's really what it's all about like we've got people who who thought they knew about bitcoin uh, but they hadn't even used the Lightning Network yet, right? Even though it's been around for so long. So this is a really fun way to play with the Lightning Network. And you feel like more comfortable playing with it when you didn't go out and buy the Bitcoin yourself. You actually earned it just from playing the game. And then you're more likely to then spend it and actually get experience with it. So if you want to get experience with Bitcoin, come check it out. Yeah, yeah. It's um, a really cool project. And it reminds me of the broader concept towards value for value which you'll be familiar with um things like fountain or wave lake and these different places where you can stream music or you can do a podcast and people can stream value over the lightning network um i'm just trying to think back to my young days playing counter-strike and if i got some sets every time i got a headshot um or <laughs> or whatever or you, you get penalized if you're you're camping um i don't know man i, I can see just like as you said BitTorrent, uh, in the same way 
it's a grassroots movement bottom up it's going to bring change and maybe these these kids who are playing in this game right now are the ones who are going to be uh, coming into the productive workforce in the coming years and this will be all they know and they'll look at a bank and they'll think what is this mm. scam and they're going to bring all the uh, new technology to help us bitcoiners like sometimes bitcoiners think that they know everything but really these young people who are they're pretty smart. more exposed yeah. yeah they're smart and they're using all these tools every day like especially with the new stuff with ai like they're going to have good ideas to help bitcoin too yeah sweet man all right james i much appreciate it thank you all right awesome catch sweet. you later See you, mate. thank you for listening i do hope you enjoyed the show i am cody ellingham and that was the transformation of value if you would like to get in touch, please send me an email at hello at the transformation of value.com and I will get back to you.